Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's EOA Better Together webinar. You're all very welcome. Um, I hope you're safe and well and managing to adapt in these challenging times. Just a bit of housekeeping before we start. For those of you who've not used one of these Zoom webinars before, down at the bottom of your screen, you will see that there is um, a Q&A button. If you've got any questions, if you've got any um, uh, comments to make on what you hear, please do submit those through the Q&A function. If you've got any technical challenges, then please do click the um, chat button. Uh, my colleague Annabelle will be able to help if you have any problems accessing this webinar. So, um, uh, we're also recording uh, the webinar as usual, so there are a couple of slides being used by a couple of the speakers today. If you don't have a chance to capture the content of those slides as valuable, because it will be very valuable, um, then please just, you can download the recording afterwards. So, um, we're delighted that so many of you are joining us on these webinars. Uh, as of our last one last week, we have done four. Um, 250 people have joined us live on the webinars and a further 260 people have downloaded them since. So um, we're absolutely delighted that members and other organisations from the employer and community are getting such value from these webinars. Um, today's webinar is entitled How to Guide Your Business Through Challenging Times um, and the Role of the Trustee. And um, there's never been more uh, an important time for the trustees to have a role to play. But before we move on to that, I just want to bring you up to speed with what's happened um, across the government and across our membership in the last week since our last webinar. So firstly, all of you will know that the job retention scheme, uh, the furloughing scheme as, as it's been referred to, was extended um, as of last Saturday. So it's now extended to the end of June, which um, I think was a, a welcome relief for many businesses who were facing the prospect potentially of having to issue redundancy notices. Um, what we also learned last weekend is that there was an extension of the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme uh, which previously had only been for smaller businesses up to a turnover of 45 million with the introduction last weekend of a large business scheme. So for businesses over 45 million pounds turnover, there's now an opportunity to access um, uh, loans of either 25 million or 50 million dependent on turnover. So another welcome um, uh, additional product in the, the finance marketplace. Um, and although Sybils and the release of the funds through Sybils have been uh, challenging and criticised by some, um, as of this morning, the latest statistics from UK Finance show that 36,000 applications are so far in for funding and about 16,500 of those have received funding or are in the process of receiving funding. And interestingly, um, over half of those um, approvals have happened in the last eight days. So there's clearly been a move by the government to unlock some of the challenge of getting cash out into businesses like yours. Um, notwithstanding that, there has been pressure on the government all this week um, from the opposition, the, the new shadow uh, business secretary, Ed Miliband, and many others um, putting pressure on the Treasury um, as yet unanswered to increase the level of guarantee from 80% to 100% uh, with the belief that that might release more money into the market quicker. So we'll wait and watch and see what happens there. So I think that's a, a roundup of what's happened in the last week. Um, so we'll move on now to today's uh, webinar, which, as I said earlier, is about the role of the trustee. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted we've got three um, people who are going to join us now, um, share with us their expertise, their experiences and their insights. And the first person I'm going to welcome is Campbell MacDonald. Um, Campbell has been um, a advisor in the EOA space for over 12 years now um, and as part of Baxendale um, and also advising um, the John Lewis partnership. Um, he's also worked as an independent advisor to many tr transitions and cultural change um, projects. Um, in addition to his current role now as a Chair of Trustees of Broadway and Mallion, um, he's also a trustee of the new independent think tank, Ownership at Work. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Campbell now, um, who's going to share some of his insights around this challenge of the role of the trustee. Hi, Campbell. Hi, Deb. Thanks for that. Um, 
appreciate that intro and uh, good afternoon to everybody who has joined. Um, okay, so I've got about seven or eight minutes. Um, I am very quickly going to just touch on me. I'm then going to set out what I think is a big trap for leaders uh, in any crisis, even EO leaders. And then I'm going to talk about the way out and the role that trustees play in that. And then I'm going to end with a, a live example from, uh, from Broadway Malian. Uh, I'm going to talk super quick um, and I am going to put up a screen at the end. So if you want to screen grab some of what I'm saying, then you can do it then or you can uh, chase it on the recording. So um, look, the, uh, the deal that we all know about, that we're all familiar with, uh, is uh, that we share information, influence, reward, and we are clear about the behaviours that we want from people in our businesses. And in return, we get energy, we get passion, we get engine fuel, if you like. Um, and in a crisis, particularly a financial crisis, that energy is absolutely paramount. And this is the trap. So the trap is that during a crisis, leaders quite often stop sharing. They're worried about sharing information. The opportunities for influence dry up. Nobody wants to talk about sharing reward and they don't talk about behaviors. But right at the moment where the deal is broken and that fuel line is cut, they need those behaviors more than ever. So that's the trap. And what I'm really quickly going to do is talk about under those headings, therefore, what I think leaders should be doing and what you as trustees should be asking for. So look, under information, leaders have got to keep sharing information. You, you know, they've got to keep communicating, even if there's nothing new to communicate. Look, and of course you can't share everything with everybody at this point, um, but you've got to be candid. You've got to be honest with people about what the stakes are. You've got to be honest with people about what you don't know as leaders, and you need to keep providing really clear reporting. Share what you can with people, but definitely share everything with trustees. For trustees, you should be a asking for that reporting and that information, but you should be looking to coordinate some of your communications uh, with your exec or your board. You've got to keep talking to colleagues directly and you've got to keep getting their feedback and feeding it in. Under influence, look, it's just critical that boards and execs keep a dialogue going with their trustees. You need a kind of rapid form accountability during a period like this. Apart from anything else, you can't waste time going back and forth all the time. They've got to talk to you as trustees. And on your part, trustees, you've got to put in challenge. You've got to put in constructive ideas. You've got to pass feedback that's useful. Your aim here is to help strengthen the decision making that happens. Um, under reward, the reward right now is survival. That's the immediate reward. Sometimes leaders are, are frightened of saying that out loud but also you've got to talk about what the prize is in the future you've got to talk about why everybody's doing this um and for your part as trustees you need to reinforce that reward principle as well that when we get back to good times there will be uh you know hay to share you've got to put in some creative recommendations help leaders think about what are the ways when you don't have cash to actively think about other ways of rewarding and then the final bit is behaviors. So look, leaders, you've got to provide a clear roadmap. You've got to be really clear about what it is that you want from people. Everybody knows you're not going to have all the answers. You can be honest about that, but you need to tell people how they can contribute to recovery. And for your part, trustees, you're the guardian of the core values of the business. You know, you should be looking to the business to demonstrate that they're doing more than just the ordinary response. Are they putting values central to their decision making? Ask for some clear principles on, the, on those decisions being made. And all of you have got to lead by example. So look, that's my, that's my kind of breakdown. And I'm just going to give you a quick live example from, uh, from Broadway Malian. So they're an architecture, urbanism design firm. I'm the independent chair of trustees. There's about 500 people, 12 studios all around the world. Um, these guys have actually been incredibly good. The leadership, um, we first approached them because we had a Shanghai studio. We approached them back in January to say, look, this, this, what is this? Um, and ever since then, 
they have been incredibly good at sharing information with the trustees, but also more broadly, just making themselves rapidly accountable, like I said, sustaining dialogue. Um, the one thing I think they hadn't really thought about is maybe future prize, and there's definitely that nervousness. And look, as sort of uncertainty and lockdown fatigue kicks in with everybody, you know, there's a danger that some of that energy that I talked about, that engine fuel sort of really, really wears thin and that the risk of the trap gets even more important. Um, and what, what we've done as a group of trustees, just to finish on in, in Broadway, is uh, in Broadway Malian, is um, we have made a suggestion that around what the really powerful narrative could be for the for the board to take with the rest of the business. And that that's, um, you know, we put it slightly differently about sharing that people share in the pain now. And that's the clear principles on how that's going to be done fairly. Uh, again, looking for the board to recognize, for instance, the disproportionate impact of some of the financial restrictions on more junior staff. So, you know, sharing pain and doing it fairly, sharing responsibility for recovery, that's that roadmap and clear instructions, and then sharing future reward, so survival, but also just encouraging them to think about different kinds of incentive, days in lieu, um, you know, direct shareholding even. Um, what else we've done very quickly, uh, look, we now meet with the exec, we get half an hour with them after their weekly exec meetings, we hear from the MD and the FD on, on anything new and important, um, and we have our immediate chance to feedback. That's incredibly helpful. Where it's appropriate and we've seen a clear rationale and we back the business's choices, we, we coordinate our comms just to take that loop out so people aren't coming back to us saying, well, did you know about this? Um, we, uh, you know, a very quick instance, we, we initially, you know, they've, they've introduced a salary reduction, universal, right across the business, as you all know, same principle as, for instance, JLP partnership bonus. We challenged them on whether that should be tiered early on. The essence was speed, so they haven't done that in the first instance, but future measures, they're going to look at that. So that's the kind of way that that should work. We positioned our reps in all of our studios to uh, be play a supporting role to all their colleagues globally we're trying to gather kind of human stories about how people have responded to this and how they're staying in touch and share those so people can learn from one another um, and we're just trying to identify ways to bring people together uh, around common common kind of cultural themes and lessons learned and so on so look that's a lot I hope that's all helpful uh, Annabelle you use the last 10 seconds just to stick up that slide that would be really really helpful um, and I'm happy to take questions, obviously, uh, and I'll be quiet now. Campbell, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. I'll just let that slide stay up for a couple of seconds longer. There was an awful lot of fantastic content there, and I know people will be keen to, to maybe take notes. But don't forget, we are recording this, so you can pick this up again on the recording. Um, I'm going to come back to Campbell in a few minutes um, after we've heard from our second speaker. So our second speaker is Angela Brown. Um, she's the chair of the Partnership Council at Child child-based partnership. She's worked in the company for eight years, so she knows the business very well. Um, and indeed, some of you will have seen her at our annual conference where she won an award a couple of years ago. So I'm absolutely delighted. Uh, Angela's joined us this afternoon. She's gonna share some of the experience that the partnership there has had over the last few weeks as they've been dealing with this uh, tremendous challenge of, of maintaining effective engagement and communications with partners. So over to you, Angela. Good afternoon, everybody. So after that extremely helpful look at the potential pitfalls, I thought it'd be helpful to share the story of how Childbase has been handling the situation with a more broad overview. So it's probably best for me to give you a bit of a brief um, history of Childbase. Formed in 1989 with just one nursery, we have grown to become a leading UK provider of childcare in the early years education, with currently 43 day nurseries throughout the south of England, providing care for nearly 6,000 children. So in that pursuit, we aim to provide the highest quality care for each of those children, as well as high quality training for our over 2,000 staff. So in line with the government direction, we are remaining open as usual to our clients that are serving as key workers, be that delivery drivers, doctors, or those who are working hard to keep the shops open. So this is obviously a much smaller percentage of our usual occupancy. And as a service-based business, I'm sure you're aware that for many of our colleagues, working from home was never going to be an opportunity. 
So in terms of our ownership structure, Childbrace operates a 100% trust ownership model with oversight from four employee trustees, as well as three non-executive trust directors. One of the embedded strengths that has served Childbrace well during this period of uncertainty is the level of openness and communication. The trust has received weekly updates on the progress being made in terms of the move to furlough members of the team, our positions with various agencies, as well as what plans Childbase has to ensure the best for the future of the company. As always, all questions were answered promptly and honestly. As chair of the Partnership Council, the representative body of colleagues at Childbase, I was included in many of the board conversations about how best to protect our colleagues, but also to ensure that communications were clear and understandable. I made sure that the council was apprised of any decisions as soon as practically possible and was able to collect any initial concerns or signpost um, colleagues for information. So with the information from Public Health England and the government being updated almost daily with information that affected many of the departments within the company, such as our human resources team, our health and safety team, and even slight shifts in the way that the teaching opportunities could be provided to the children in our care, it became clear very early on that too many communications from too many sources would really drown the key essential messages and possibly hinder the implementation of some of these essential changes. So all that communication was then com consolidated into one daily communication detailing the governmental updates, the effects that those had on our colleagues, as well as our working practices. Prior to the government's announcement of the furloughing opportunities, we had already removed from the business those that were at the highest level of risk. With the decision, when the decision was made to begin the process of furloughing colleagues, the partnership council was informed of this decision and had all documentation provided to them to ensure they were able to support colleagues with questions and queries. Due to the potential sensitivity of the nature of some of these conversations, the site manager led these conversations. So we now have a mix of councillors that are furloughed, as well as those that are still working within the business, with me acting as a resource for those who do not currently have a councillor within their site. At every step of the decision-making process, those involved stopped to consider if this was the best course of action, as well as taking time to consult with those who have the benefit of working at the coalface, as it were. So now that we've settled into more of a routine, um, one thing that was paramount in the minds of everyone, um, regardless of whether people were continuing to work within the business or were currently furloughed, was that each person needed to have the same level of communication. So with that in mind, weekly communications are sent out to all colleagues. These include updates on what have been happening within the business, no matter how big or small they are, as well as signposting uh, for wellbeing support, as we know many of our colleagues uh, will find this period particularly hard to deal with. For those that are furloughed, a specific communication for them has been developed to ensure that they're coping at this time and don't feel too isolated. It's been great to see what some colleagues have been getting up to in their spare time. And in the spirit of being in it together, all colleagues have been invited to take part of a dance competition, which has lifted the spirits of those within the nursery as well as those at home. So I can't wait to see the outcome of that. I'm always, I always say that I'm proud of my colleagues, but now they have really shown what they're made of. Firstly, our colleagues that were working at this very surreal time are providing exceptionally well for those that remain in their care. The updates that I see on the activities taking place are really heartwarming. As with any situation that we can't anticipate, there were always going to be so many questions, some of which took time to respond to. The patience with which my colleagues conducted themselves was outstanding, which meant the executive teams were able to consider these more difficult and nuanced circumstances more effectively which as always makes for better decision making. I'm well aware that this is not the end, but I'm sure by, by, that by continuing to use the methods which have helped Childbase over the years, we will continue to fight on. So now I'd like to hand back to Deb. Thank you, Angela. Um, the dance competition sounds a really interesting um, activity. So I'll be looking forward to hearing the results of that as well. Um, so whilst um, we just prepare the next speaker don't forget you can put your questions through to us we've had a couple already and we had about half a dozen submitted before the webinar started so if you want to put your questions through just use the Q&A button at the bottom 
So um, before we uh, take questions to Angela and Campbell, I now want to introduce our third speaker, and this is Robert Postlethwaite. Many of you will know Robert. He's the managing director of Postlethwaite, a, a law firm which specialises in employee ownership and, and is a uh, member of the EOA. Um, on top of that, Robert and some of his colleagues are also trustees of several different employee and trust based businesses. So Robert, I'm delighted to have you here this afternoon. Um, glad you got the dress code about dressing in either navy blue or yellow because we seem to have got a nice colour wash going on this afternoon um, and I'm going to hand over to you so you can talk to us a little bit more about some of the technical legal obligations on trustees. Thank you. Robert can you just take your your um, microphone off mute? There Sorry. you go. I thought That's, I'd okay. That. That's okay um, no worries. Uh, so hopefully everybody can hear me now. I'm going to be wearing two hats this afternoon. Um, firstly, um, just to give you a little bit of um, my own experience as a lawyer who's been working with some companies that uh, uh, are employee owned and have come up with questions about um, what their trustees should be doing in the current situation. And then the other hat I've been wearing is actually as a as a trustee of two different employee ownership trusts. So as you can imagine, um, we've been quite busy um, over the last month or so, um, and I, I've gleaned what I think is some a, a small number of kind of practical tips, which I hope will be fresh to you um, and which I hope will be useful. So just starting off with the uh, with me wearing my lawyer hat. Um, I'm going to start by saying, and you probably all know this already, um, that as trustees of an employee trust, your primary duty is to act in the best interests of the beneficiaries of the trust, um, which will be some definition of the employees of the company. Now, it's obviously very easy to say that and can be somewhat harder in practice to work out what that actually means in certain situations. So just to try and add a little bit more flesh to that, um, two or three more things to add. So the first is you will definitely have a trust deed, of course, and there may be some information in the trust deed which gives you a steer on what kind of slightly more precise things you need to be taking into account in your decision making. So, for example, it might set out some values of the company. Um, or give you something of a definition of what, what we actually mean by what's in the best interest of the beneficiaries. So if you haven't already done that, it's worth having a look at the trust deed and see if there's any, uh, any steer and guidance in there. Second thing is, um, there may be some wider documentation as part of your ownership structure. In particular, um, there may be some provisions which say, well, if the directors of the company want to do certain things, then they will have to at least consult with the trustees and maybe get their permission. So, for example, uh, if they wanted to make a significant number of people redundant, then there might be a specific provision which says the, that decision can't be made until the trustees have been involved. Um, and the third thing to say is um, no one ever expects trustees to get all their decisions perfectly right. They're never going to be 100% right, nor are they ever going to be 100% fair. So what's expected of you is to do the best you reasonably can, but no one is expecting perfection. OK, so um, one more thing, actually, um, which is the importance of avoiding groupthink. Um, now, there can be a tendency um, to, if you're a trustee, um, to think, well, there are a lot of loud voices in this room. There's a lot of what looks like experience. I don't really necessarily know um, as much as the other people, so I'm just going to pipe down. Um, but if you have a question, you must always ask it. There's no such thing as a stupid question. So make sure that you do ask your questions, because otherwise there can be a risk of decisions being made without them properly having been considered and this terrible thing called groupthink. Um, also, always remember that your company is different and has its own circumstances. So don't assume that the situation your company is in is the same as everybody else's. 
Um, so give you another example. Um, I was talking to a company recently, which in the first week of the job retention scheme becoming available, had put on furlough a large number of their employees. Um, and then they decided two, three weeks later that actually they'd made that decision too early. They thought, well, everybody else is doing it, so we should be doing it as well. But actually, it wasn't the right thing for their business. I think some of those employees will be coming off furlough and possibly shouldn't have been on it in the first place. Um, OK, in the remaining time, just a little uh, small number of other things based on my own recent experience. Um, both of the companies where I'm a trustee, I would say the directors have been very proactive. So we as trustees haven't had to contact the directors and say, what are you doing in the current situation? Because the initiative has come from the board of directors. But in a situation where that's not happening and the silence from the board, then you as trustees should really be asking them, what are they doing? What is their plan to deal with the current situation? Is it causing problems for the business or potentially um, what the directors pros propose to do to address those? Um, second thing I've also seen is there have been benefits of uh, consulting more widely with employees. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Um, one of the companies I'm involved with, there has been a proposal to um, furlough employees on 80% of their salary. Um, but after discussion with some of those employees, it became very clear that, that, that um, a number of them wouldn't be able to pay their rent. Um, they, the employees affected were all trainee architects who aren't paid very much at the best of times. On 80% of their salary, they wouldn't be able to pay their rent. Uh, and that wouldn't have become obvious unless there had been a consultation with the employee council. So it was really important to get that out. Um, another thing I've also seen is directors almost too willing to sacrifice themselves, almost feeling, well, leading for the front means sacrificing ourselves before anybody else. Um, that's not always the right thing because the company must continue to have a strong leadership team in place. Um, and that's not going to be the case if uh, half of the directors have gone on furlough. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to emphasize the importance of looking to the future as well as the present. So we're all in this to survive, but why are we looking to survive? Because we believe there is a future. So we need to bear that in mind in any decisions we make and what's going to happen longer term and what the company's going to look like longer term. Um, I do have some slides which summarise what I've said, if anyone wants a quick glance at them. Um, I'm going to hand back to Deb now. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Robert. And I'll just let that slide stay up for a few more seconds. Um, and whilst that's happening, if Campbell and Angela, if you'd like to, to join the panel. Um, so thank you all three of you for some fantastic insights there, um, some really interesting uh, tips and tricks and we've got some uh, questions now. Robert if you want to just um, bring your video back and your, there we go. Um, we've got some questions now that have been coming in uh, so I'm going to start with a couple that have come in while we've been live although we've got a number that have also come forward before the event. So um, very pertinent actually to what the point you were just saying Robert um, which is there's a question here from somebody they're in a situation where the trustees feel they're not getting enough information through from the board about scenario planning, about the cash saving measures. Um, and they're given a bit of a sense that they're meddling a bit. Have they got any tips about how to manage this dynamic? How could they get the board to release a bit more information? I don't know, I'm looking at Robert, but maybe Angela, maybe Campbell, you've got some tips as well on that. But well, start I'll, with Robert. I'll dip in to start, but I, I probably haven't got the full answer here. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say just um, keep keep the pressure on and they need to make it clear that to the directors that they've got a duty, which in order to comply with that duty, they need information. And if the directors won't supply it, let's not get to this situation if we po can possibly avoid it. But if the directors won't supply it, they need to say why um, they're not able to do that. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, yep. Sorry, Campbell. Just quickly, I mean, just because, you know, ha having been one, you know, directors tend to think like this and in an ideal world, maybe you wouldn't have to put it this way, but I think you should just put a, a simple benefits case behind why 
they should be sharing more information and and you know getting your input so for instance ultimately you're going to have stronger decision making you know uh, you can as trustees coordinate your communications which will ideally ultimately strengthen buy-in from everybody in the business and ultimately that's what you need that's that's the engine fuel that i talked about um so yeah great thanks campbell um i've got another question here which i think relates back to the best interests of beneficiaries um so i guess angela and campbell you might have a view on this we all know that that's what the trustees are there to do they're acting in the best interests of the beneficiaries and the beneficiaries are the employees but a question we've had submitted is what does this mean in difficult times when the decisions that you might take now could be in the best interest of the long-term health of the business, but they may not be in the best interest of the short-term health of the of the beneficiaries. So I guess, Campbell, have you got a take on how do you how do you do you manage that divide? Yeah, look, it's it's really helpful for everybody to remind themselves that they have the same ultimate aim. Okay, which is the survival of the business. Because hmm. if you ain't got a business, then you ain't got any livelihoods. Simple as that. Uh, yeah. So everybody's running at the same North Star, um, but leaders are going to have to make really, really hard trade-offs at this point. Um, and as trustees, you know, you are not going to be able to be in the detail of all of that. Um, but that's why you're asking for principles. That's why you want the, the clear principles behind how decisions are going to be made. And you just want to know that every option has been looked at. Mm. You want you want to know that the, the the challenge I would put as how when we look back how are we going to know that we weren't just the same as every other business? If we're an a values led employee owned firm, how did we do this differently? Great, Andrew. Have you had that same challenge at Childbase about what's the best interest for the beneficiaries versus what's the best interest for the business? Um, up to this stage, not so much. But I think it's always something that you consider in the back of your mind. Of you know, there are certain opportunities, certain, certain situations that we might come to further down the road. But I think following on from what Campbell said, the the balancing act is you know we need to ensure that there is a business to benefit the beneficiary. So whilst in terms in the future there might be some detrimental effects to a, a smaller group possibly um the beneficiaries of, a, of a, as a whole is what what we're considering yeah great and I, I guess it reflects on your point earlier on Campbell as well which is in a world where we look to share reward the reward we'll share now is survival so mm -hmm. Um, I've got to air this question because we've had this now four times. It's the same question. I'm going to go straight to Robert. Um, can trustees still act as trustees if they are furloughed? Um, yes, I think they can. Um, so I'll say three things around that. First is the government, recent government updated guidelines on furloughing says that if you're a director of a company and you're furloughed, you can still carry on performing your director duties. So I think there's a direct um, correlation between that and being a uh, trustee of an employee ownership trust. Um, there's a couple of things to watch out for. First, it's probably a good idea that you're not paid a separate amount for being a trustee. So you get your normal furlough money as an employee, but don't get anything else as a, as a trustee, otherwise that might muddy the waters. And second, just watch how much time you're, you're, you're spending doing it. So a couple of hours a week, maybe a bit more would be fine, but if it's beginning to look you know, more like a, a full-time job, then um, yeah, you need to be much more careful about that. But otherwise, fine, I think. I think there's a, there's a supplementary question from someone as well about should trustees be involved in the decision-making criteria around who gets furloughed? Robert, can I ask you first on that? Um, I think trustees should, as far as they possibly can, step back from um, getting involved in individual decisions about affecting individual employees. They should be looking at the big picture um, rather than that kind of granular decision. That's my view. Can I ask Angela and Campbell? Campbell, in your role as Broadway Mallion, have, have the trustees been exposed to that granularity of decision making? No, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't expect to be. I, I, 
just to be clear, you know, you you use in the question the word principles. Um, you know, m my guiding kind of views on this are you should have information, you should have data as trustees, but that's numbers, not names. Um, and it's it's a it's about having some clear decision making principles, some clean, clear rationale. Um, as long as you can see that, I don't think that you know. I don't think you should be sat in the room saying yes, no to to this or to that or to this person or that person. Yeah. Angela, have you got anything to add? No, very similar, more the rationale as opposed to specifics. It's the, and it hasn't changed since before, you know. There are operational decisions that were being made and it was more balances and checkers, checks as towards why those are, decisions are being made as opposed to what specifically is the, the detail in it. It's interesting because both, both of you, Angela and Campbell, seem to be talking about this. You, you've used the word principles. Uh, Angela, you've used the word rationale. You're talking about the same thing, which is the decision-making for the trustees not at an operational granular level, but more based around principles that are agreed and guiding the board around those principles. Um, another couple of interesting questions, very, very uh, pragmatic questions, one here. Um, as trustees, what level of information should we be asking of the board now? So what specifically we should be asking? I guess this may have come from someone who is maybe not as um, experienced as a trustee, but what could they expect would be a reasonable set of questions to ask the board now. Anybody want to offer a thought on that? I know, Campbell, you gave us your views of asking for information and being constructive in the decision making, but when you say ask for information, have you got some specifics that you would expect trustees to be asking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would hope that all trustees are receiving management accounts at the best of times anyway. Um, I would think that all leadership teams will be, will be rerunning accounts week week on week practically at this point um, and they'll be running longer term scenario plans to see whether or not you know they're predicting a v-shaped bounce back or a u-shaped bounce back and so on so i would hope that all of those would be being shared with um trustees uh, i think that um i think like i said you want to know numbers as well rather than names um, yeah. Uh, in terms of people and also don't forget this isn't just about performance you know the thing that the Broadway Malian leadership have done incredibly well is right from the off they were very very clear that this was about protecting people as well as protecting performance um, and so the metrics that you would hope that the business are measuring themselves against and that you as trustees would be asking to see is yes you know kind of impact on top line cost management measures profit forecasts but also um yeah and cash you know because that's going to be the real killer for everybody but you know also how many people are on furlough what level of you know salary does that leave them on um does anybody is is everybody healthy and well you know Who's, when was the last time people heard from people? Yeah, I mean, it sounds, you know, however you get those metrics, they're super, super important. Um, just so you're doing the, the human as well as the, the, the um, economic part of your job. Just got a couple more questions. I want to bring this back to Robert's point about looking to the future linked to behaviours. Um, so we've got a question here. Um, if trust is not really present um, in the business and you haven't had chance to develop the level of trust. Um, has anybody got any tips on how that can be developed and how trustees can support that? So again, I guess this may have come from a business that's relatively new to employee ownership and they haven't built that two-way trust up between the trustees and the board. So if it's not there in the middle of a crisis, is it unreasonable to expect that you can develop it? If you're going to develop it, what what could you might what might you suggest? Anybody got any thoughts on that? I mean, I do, but I'm talking a lot, so. <laughs> well, Robert, did you hold your hand up? Uh, well, I'll start, but I, I reckon uh, Angela and Campbell could could then dip, dip in as well. So I'm just going to say I think it, there's an opportunity there. Um, so if you can't, um, you know, create trust in in a situation where you're relatively early into an employee ownership where openness and communication coming back to Campbell's point about not falling into the trap 
is absolutely most, the most important thing, then trustees should be, who are new to the role, that's the, the thing they should be really focusing on. And, and that, that's how they're going to build up trust if they're going to do it at all. Okay. Angela, I don't know if you've got anything to add. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that level of communication and not feeling like you're going to scare anyone with being honest. I think it's that honest communication as well, not just sharing the numbers that you feel comfortable sharing. Sometimes it's sharing that nitty gritty and explaining the rationale behind it and helping people understand and being patient with those questions that help build that trust. Because when you have that working two level of two way communication, I think that that works really well. I'm just going to try and throw one more question in. We're, 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 we're moving on on time. Um, another question's come in about how can you involve furloughed staff in decision making? Now, I'm not sure if that means furloughed staff who are also trustees, because if it does, then I think, Robert, you gave us an answer about that, which is trustees can still perform their trustee duties. I guess this might be more about the communications piece and how you know where decisions are needing to be made um, and staff are on furlough. Can you involve them and does that constitute work? There's an interesting one because you're not allowed to work when you're on furlough. I don't know if what, what's your view of that, Angela? You talked about having some tailored communications to your team members who are on furlough. Um, are, are you able to reach out and ask their views and opinions as well as communicating with them? Um, not as an overall method, but there's each site has their own individual communication method. So um, at the support site that I'm supporting at the moment, they have their own WhatsApp group. So there's a lot of two-way communication there, as it's always been. So it's not necessarily work. It's more so just that keeping that communication up. Um, but they always have an opportunity to bring that communication back as opposed to, and it's not, it's not work, it's just checking in how are you doing as opposed to we need you to run these numbers for us or what, how do we do this? It's, it's always just keeping that more of a well-being, I think, aspect to it um, as opposed to work, I would say, is what we're doing at Childbase. What about you, Campbell? So, uh, look, I, I don't want to speak, I don't want to cut across the employment law position on this and I don't know what it is. My, 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 instinct is that you know you if somebody's furloughed you cannot expect them to respond to emails and so on uh you know you, you you are not entitled to have that expectation that said i think people wear different hats i think the whole point about people being worker owners is that you you have a hat as an employee and you have a hat as an owner and a bit like robert split earlier you know i think that if people are clear that they're wearing an owner hat and they still want their voice to be heard and the billing the bill the business is willing to listen to it then you know people can't be compelled but they should have the option to contribute feed in interesting perspective interesting perspective um, i'm just going to ask two very uh, final questions before we move on um uh very technical question here. Somebody's asking, uh, would be interested to know what other businesses are doing in terms of scenario planning, best case, worst, worst case, and what time frames they're using, three months, six months, nine months. I mean, that's a very specific question. And I guess if we asked half a dozen businesses, we'd get half a dozen answers. Whoever asked that question, and I think it's come in anonymously. Yes, it has. Uh, can I suggest you maybe go on the EO hub and ask that question? You'll probably get a good flavour back. Um, and there's another question here about very small businesses that maybe don't have the benefit of management accounts. So without the benefit of regularly provided management accounts, as trustees, how can you really get a sight of the numbers and how can you really understand um, you know, the, the business performance at that level. I don't know if, um, Robert, you have dealt with, Campbell, you have as well, lots of businesses that are employee-owned rather than just one. Have you got any tips there for the very smallest businesses? Robert? Um, well, the only thing I'd say is, I mean, without financial information, you, you're you completely dead, actually. I mean, you, <laughs> you can't make any decisions, so you've got to find a way of, of doing it somehow um yeah i mean it doesn't necessarily need to be formal management accounts but yeah. some snapshot of uh, what cash looks like um at the very least and what it looks like for the next four weeks or so or you know two or three months um but yeah you've got to find a way of putting some financial information together campbell have you got any tips yes. sorry deb have i got time to yeah you have 
Yeah, yeah. I might just very quickly, you know, um, on on that and the, the earlier question that that I didn't answer. Yeah, you know, someone someone somewhere in your business is sat on financial information, right? And there's no way your deed of trust doesn't commit that the business should be providing information, you know, on request to the trust. So, you know, you 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 have both a a, a stick. But go to the earlier question. I've all, I'm a big believer that trustees have to earn their place at the table. Right. So, so you shouldn't hopefully be in the position where you have to force it, you know, but when you, you know, ask yourselves, what are you going to do with the information and how are you going to strengthen decision making? How are you going to contribute to survival? You know, this isn't just about bashing people who are struggling. Look, make the comparison. You know, I, whatever you think of the current government, we're in an unprecedented situation. And a lot of people are saying, you know, look, the criticism is valid and there will be time for it but simply pummeling a group of people who are, who are trying to you know, do the best for the situation right now. You know, your leaders are in that same position. So just chucking bricks at them right now is not going to help. You should all be collaborating to try and find a solution out of this. Fantastic. Well, do you know what? I think we probably could go on for another 15 minutes at least, but um, we do sort of get to a point where we need to draw it to a close. I'm just going to do my best at summarising, I think, what you three have shared. Um, it's been a masterclass in trustees. I'm sure there's lots more questions that people want to ask. Um, but what we heard from you, Campbell, was um, these businesses, employer businesses, are renowned for sharing information, influence and reward. However, you've described it as the big trap. The big trap for leadership in times of crisis is they find it hard to share the information. They stop offering opportunities for influence and who knows what reward even looks like. So your four points I think you made were trustees need to ask for information. And we have lots of examples there about what type of information you might want. Um, but this is also about principles, not about granularity. And it's about numbers, not names, was your message. That in decision making, trustees should be constructive as well as challenging, but looking for constructive solutions. That they need to reinforce that reward issue of survival. You know, as you just said very lucidly then at the end, you know, no point in hammering the leadership team if this is all about survival and trustees need to play their part. And lastly, that really important part, which is about being guardians of values and leading by example so that we come out of this. You know, I think your phrase in previous conversations I've had with you, Campbell, is as saints, not sinners. Then we heard from Angela about the importance of communications and three key points I took out there was Communication should be open and honest, and also that they're regular and timely. But that when you've got lots of information coming out, make sure you consolidate it all, otherwise it loses its impact. They don't have lots of different strands of information. And finally, make sure you tailor that information so that it's suitable for the audience. So, for example, Angela's point about tailored information for the furloughed staff. And then Robert's key tips, really, really basic stuff that we shouldn't forget. Go and revisit your trust deed. Look at the rules of engagement. See what you're supposed to be doing, what you're supposed to be involved in as trustees. Avoid groupthink by doing more of what Campbell said, actually, which is asking questions, asking for the information. Don't just assume because it fellow works for one business, it'll work for yours. And remember that every business is unique. And I think also Robert's really important last point, no one's an expert. And this and nobody expects perfection so you know give yourself a break if as a group of trustees you're not always getting it right all of the time I'm just struck by the very last point which is looking to the future and you know Robert you made that point we are going to come out of this at some point uh, Campbell you made the point about you know leading by example being guardians of those values and Angela you talked about you know when when we come out of this, we might be slightly different in shape, but we'll still be there. And I think that's the thing that we all need to hold on to here. And the trustee role, of course, is in that long term sustainability for the business. So thank you once again for all of your contributions. The two slides that Campbell and Robert used will be available on the um, on the recording of this. And of course, if you've got any questions for Campbell, Angela or Robert, just fill them through to your usual contact at the EOA and we'll make sure we put you in contact. So just leaves me now to say a quick uh, goodbye to everybody and just to remind you about next week's webinar. So next week's webinar, we're back at 11 o'clock um, and webinar is the art of good leadership during a crisis. 
Um, and we've heard a little bit about leadership uh, today. Um, I'm absolutely delighted next week we've got uh, Stefan Stern. He's a former columnist with the Financial Times and Management Today, and he also authored Ownership at Work's latest paper on leadership. He's going to be joined by two leaders from EO Businesses. Um, we're starting at 11 o'clock next week. Um, similar sort of format, lots of insight and tips and uh, reflections. And don't forget the other ways you can get in touch with us using the hub, as I suggested. Going and listening to the webinars that we've already recorded. There was one on cash flow last week, which could be really interesting for the people asking about um, financial information earlier on. Um, we have a weekly newsletter, which is EO Community, um, and of course, all the usual contacts at the EOA. So um, I hope you have a good rest of Thursday and we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Deb. Thanks a lot, Angela. Thanks, Robert.